All right, good morning, guys, and welcome to the Sports Buffet on Elegbata TV Radio. My name is Edafi Matthias. You're gonna you love to call me the Elegbata one of sports, and um, I, I think that you know how they say that once in a lifetime you would have that one opportunity, that one opportunity that changes and defines your career, that one moment that makes you say, yes, I went from being regular, from being ordinary to being extraordinary. That one moment where heavens touch the head, okay? Uh, where, where what you dream of become your reality. So, guys, I, I know that I've said it on Twitter and Instagram and across all my social media platform about the fact that this show today is a special one first off we had to move it forward by 30 minutes and we have to adjust the show a little bit but let me give you guys a little bit of a background before i bring my guest on board the show today so i've been trying to interview this colossal human being for 15 years first time i wanted to interview him was in 2007 yes you get that right 2007 I made all the effort, everything humanly possible to get to interview him, but I keep missing him out. Then I went to Dubai uh, for soccer race. I tried to get to interview him. It wasn't possible. Not because he didn't want to do the interview, but he was just busy. Then he came to Lagos for soccer race uh, again at the Oriental Hotels, and I tried to interview him, but my former colleague Anthony Becker the remote beat me to it and I, f- I felt like he stole my thunder but it was good because you've got to be a team player and it was good for the team and and, and, and as we move forward on the conversation I left my former employers remember how I got fired and I set up this establishment now the whole thing is the fact that I'm a I'm an Arsenal fan not only being an Arsenal fan my father actually worked for the club called Arsenal Football Club in the 60s and the 70s this is is an FA Cup medal to show for it. Uh, the 1971 FA Cup medal. Now, I'm going to push it further back down. I think that the best time, you know, in Madrid, they have a, a man called Fiorentino Perez. In Barcelona, they have a man called Juan Laporte. Not the current era, anyway. In uh, Bayern Munich, they have a man called the Kaiser himself, Franz Beckenbauer, and all of the other guys that came in. In Italy, there is a man called Silvio Balesconi for AC Milan, Morata for Inter Milan, Agnelli for Juventus. Every club have that one person whose era symbolizes and defines the greatness of that club. It's called the Golden Era. With this person, you 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 just know that once they stepped in. Everything that was bad, they've got the Midas touch, begin to turn into gold. And for him, it's not just a man that defines the club. He's the guy who defines the whole era of the modern game that we play. Uh, people talk about how good the Premier League is. I grew up in the UK and I was going in and out of the UK. I remember the British game was synonymous with gross hooliganism. The hooliganism in the British game was way out of the line, out of the mark. But then this man, after the his world disaster, decided to do something not just to complain like i always say over here we can complain all we like if we don't take a step to make a move to change things things will remain the same and there's a famous quote by this man he says if you don't stick your neck out you never win i'm talking about no other no other and he's got this plaque this 30 plaque that was given to him at the 2014 world cup if i remember that tells you that i've been i've been searching up this man everywhere and 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 he can sing too and then he's got a whole lot of nigerian and west african and west indies connection if you like sugar then you love this man if sugar has done anything good to your life then you love this man as well uh, he's a businessman he's a married man he's a father to two wonderful children he's a boss of bosses and boss of bosses bosses okay he is the doyen of industry is a captain of industry is a leader of men is a game changer and just one man who would never take no for an answer that's what as a vega this how as a vega described him that is a man that would never take no for an answer the only guy who never disagrees with him apart from maybe the you know position or reference he's got a book ad called calling the shot and there's no other person who called the shot better than this man the great the ubiquitous the amazing indefatigable david Dave. he's a former vice chairman of the 
uh, English Football Association is also former vice chairman of Arsenal. But don't be deceived by the vice chairman position because everything that happened good at Arsenal happened because this man was in charge. Good morning and welcome to the Sports Buffet, Mr. David. Good morning and thank you for that wonderful introduction. May I call you Edafi? Yes, you can call me Edafi. Okay. So, how are you doing today? I'm very well. And you know, Nigeria is really my second home, don't you? I know you that. Know I know that. And uh, I, I think that's where I'm going to start this conversation. So, you left Asna in 2007. I'm practically certain that there is not a question about Asna that I'm going to ask you that somebody I'm not asking you before uh, the whole how Sokambe was signed, the clandestine CIA, FBI, you know, marine stuff that you guys did, walking on the balcony in the night, you know, and all those questions have been asked. How you got Asen Venga from Asen Who to Asen Legend? With all those questions have been asked. So I'm going to take it a different route this time around. You have a friend in Nigeria. Uh, Africa's number one billionaire and uh, an astro businessman in Nigeria. His name is Aliko Dangote. Just about the time when you left Asna, we started hearing rumors that he's going to buy into Asna. And the first time I heard that rumor, rumor, I went on air and I said, this is the voice of, this is the hand of David Dean and the voice of Aliko Dangote. Uh, can, you, can you please affirm to me if Dangote had a conversation with you about buying over Arsenal at the time? Yeah. Well, firstly, uh, Dafe, uh, my relationship with uh, uh, Alaji Aliko Dangote goes back to about 1980, when actually he bought his very first cargo of sugar from me. I was in the sugar business at the time. And uh, he actually bought his bought some sugar from me, and then we became trading partners, we became good friends, and even now today, I keep in touch with him. In fact, I do hope that he has actually, I've asked him to distribute my book in Africa. So, calling the shots, as you can see here, I sent it a copy to him with our mutual friend, Amaju Pinnick, yesterday. Pinnick happened to be at my house, he was in London yesterday, so I gave him a personalized autographed copy to give to Aliko Dangote for him to have a look at it and I hope that within his all his organization he will take control of distributing my book because we're such good friends around the whole of Africa. So, uh... so it, the answer to your question is we did have a message when I was leaving Arsenal I did um, have a, uh, a discussion with, uh, with Aliko and I said, you know, it's an opportunity if you want to buy some shares. He thought about it at the time. He was doing so much in his own business. I think he just couldn't take on that extra responsibility. All right. Thank you very much for that. And uh, I must say that Amanji Melvin Pinnick played a very pivotal role uh, to get you to sit on the table. I uh, mean, on this table with me for us to have this conversation. But let's go back. How did uh, a young man whose mother is into food business you know evolved morphed into the kind of astute businessman that you are because you didn't come out from what you didn't grow from money you didn't come from money you come from the regular everyday human life how did you morph into this genius of a businessman who think in a different way from every other person that's very kind of your your flattery that's very nice of you thank you Adafi. um but it's all in the book and I hope you can buy the book or even get the audio version because I actually recorded the whole of the book with my own voice and the forward is by Arsene Wenger. He's also recorded his part. So anybody, if you don't want to buy the book, you can actually buy the audio version, which you can hear if you're in the gym, you're in the bath or something. You can actually listen to my words reading the book. So my life really started in... in my business life started thanks to my late mother. My mother had a shop in Shepherd's Bush Market, and this was in the 1950s. And she started to import, it was at the time when we called it the Windrush um, generation, when all of a sudden in the 1950s, there were a lot of people coming into England from West Africa, from the West Indies. And my mother realized 
when she had a little shop that people were asking her for her own foods, for yams, for okra, for plantain, for green bananas, right, for, plant, uh, for breadfruit and mangoes. And she went out and she managed to go travel out to West Africa and the West Indies and she brought in these foodstuffs. And before long, that shop became the epicenter for African people to go to for their food. And that was really my start when I started uh, developing that business with my late brother. And then I went into the sugar business after that. And then I brought into Arsenal in 1983. But the whole thing is actually very, very accurately um, yeah, put in, into, the, into the book if you get a copy of it. Yeah, one of, the, one, of, one of the things that I don't want to do with this interview is to be a spoiler for the book. So I've listened to the audio version of it. I placed an order already on Amazon for the book. I'm waiting for my delivery. Uh, and I love the fact that Asad Vega did an amazing forward uh, recorded in his office. And how he said the way you, you people came together was a marriage made in heaven, anyway. And, you know, the, the time where, we, when, when I listened to that, I was like, okay, I said, Venga was just passing by. And then he so picked to, to go watch Asna playing against Tottenham. And somehow your wife happens to be there. You see, the thing is, some of these things are written in the stars. And then you just so pick up that moment to say, let me go check up on my wife. And you went to check up on your wife and then say, oh, a friend to a friend, you want to light a cigarette. I mean, the story looked like something out of fiction. Like something written by Steven Spielberg or Stan Lee or, you know, a James Bond kind of movie. My name is James, James Bond. You know, I, but, but one of the things that I like to know from you, because I have a very large Nigerian and African audience, is... When it comes to taking decision, one of the hardest or toughest decision you've had to take as a vice chairman of Arsenal was signing a Nigerian player by the name Kanu Wankwa. And the reason being that uh, he's reached a place in his career where it felt like nobody wanted him anymore because he's got his heart condition, the iota vibe of his heart, and he's won the Olympic, he's won the under-17 uh, gold medal at the World Cup, he's done everything, he's won the UEFA Champions League with Ayers, he's won the Dutch League, the Dutch FA Cup, or the Amsterdam Cup, as it was called at the time. And this was when Morata was saying, okay, we're going to get you employed in uh, the tire business, and we'll give you a franchise or Africa, but he still wanted to play football. How did David Day decide, I am going to take the gamble of this guy? Let's not forget that at the time, medical facilities are not as advanced as we have today with uh, Ericsson at Manchester United. How did you come to that conclusion? Well, I think really uh, it was Arsene Wenger who discussed it with me, obviously. This was in 1999, and he was at the time at Inter Milan, as you know. And Arsene and I discussed it, and we said, well, I wonder whether we could get, you know, uh, Arsene suggested I go and speak to... Um, to Inter Milan and I did and it was a wonderful guy the vice president called Visconti Midroni who was running Inter Milan for Marathi and um, I went over to Milan and I spoke to him we discussed and I met obviously uh, Kanu and I felt we had a very good rapport particularly because I knew Nigeria so well I knew where he was born in Oweri um, obviously I'd been to Lagos and Kanu and all the uh, everywhere in Nigeria. I've been traveling around. We had a very good relationship and I liked him a lot. And I uh, mentioned to Arsene, I think the guy is definitely, we should try and bring him in if we can. And Arsene agreed. So we brought him over to London and obviously he had to have some serious medicals at the time because of his problem before, his heart problem. And I'm delighted to say that everything was given the all clear that they felt the operation was very successful. There was no reason why he shouldn't continue playing. And as you know, he joined us in 1999 and he stayed for five years. And he was a great player. I mean, you know, he played over 100 games for us. I think he scored over 30 goals. Uh, and he was a runner, just a, and I'm still in touch today. And when he comes to England, you know, I, I always try and see him when I can. Uh, he, he was fantastic. His attitude was wonderful. He was a good trainer. Uh, he was a great professional footballer. Uh, and Wright in his book said something about you that uh, did not make men like you anymore. Now, when he signed, when he signed from Crystal Palace for Arsenal and all of the, the contract renewals that he had, he didn't have to read it. He just, you just give him a call and say, 
right your contract is ready and he just goes in and sign because he knows that david always would take care of my needs and for as long as i sign i'm signing for the best club but not just the best club but i'm under the best man for the job which is david but let's go back because there's something about english football pre-1992 that re- that is reminiscent of what we are facing right now in nigerian football and i know that a gentleman by the name of shiro in 2005 led a team uh, that have obaseki ibrahim galadima and a host of other men from nigeria to come learn at your table how you got the job done how did we go from and and, and i use the word we now because there's a part of me that is british uh, how did we go from terrible hooliganism in english football generally and boring boring asna under graham even though we were winning titles but i mean we scored one goal in the second minute and we defend to the end of the game to asna being one of the most exciting club in the world at a time maybe behind barcelona and real madrid and then the premier league the english league going from the english league to the premier league I know you had a lot of meetings, knocking down doors. What a lot of people of this generation that are crying about VAR does not understand was that you are the man responsible for coaches having 15 minutes at halftime. I'm I, I sure a lot of people don't remember that. Can you can you elaborate on the challenges that you had to deal with? Yes. Well, when I joined the board of Arsenal in 1983. The whole turnover of the club was one and a half million pounds. Today it's nearly 500 million. So you can see how it is developed, how it's exploded. Now in the 1980s, as you quite rightly said it, Duffy, we had hooliganism. Women were not going to the games. Mothers didn't want their children to go to the games. They were worried about their safety. The grounds themselves were antiquated. They needed regenerating. They needed upgrading. They were poor. They weren't fit for purpose. And of course, Hillsborough was a big turning point for English football in 1989. Attendances were going down the drain. They were really suffering when I joined. And in fact, the late chairman, Peter Wood, when I invested in Arsenal, he said it was dead money. He couldn't understand what I was doing. But I joined the club because I felt I had something to contribute. I wanted to try and help Arsenal and indeed English football. And after Hillsborough, there was a famous meeting, which I refer to in the book, which was a very, very dramatic meeting, which was probably, for me, for me, made up my mind to form the Premier League, that meeting, when I met the parents of two children who tragically died at Hillsborough. That was a turning point for me. That's when the lights went on to say, I'm going to change football. And uh, we then decided we had four divisions in those days, making up 92 professional clubs. And my idea was to take the top division of 22 clubs and break away, form a whole new legal entity, rebrand ourselves, reinvent ourselves, call ourselves the Premier League and start again. The Premier League now this year has been going for 30 years, Edafe. It is now the most successful economic, economically successful league, the league most watched around the world. It's got nearly 2 billion viewers around the world, as you know, in Nigeria. It is the league where everybody wants to play, where the managers want to manage, and now you've got all the investors want to invest in it. So it is, it's been a huge success. It now runs at 97.8% capacity. That means every stadium in the Premier League is full. You take Arsenal Stadium, 60,000 people, week in, week out, sold out, with another 50,000 people on a wait list who can't get tickets for the games. So the Premier League has just taken off. And you've got to say, the players that we've had in over the years, and particularly from Nigeria, and obviously Kano is the first name you think of, J.J. Okocha, Amakachi, Taribo West, John Obi McKellar, Olafede Martins, Fashionu, Baba Yaro, Yakubu, Moses, um, Awobi, Igalo. We've had so many Nigerian players who come in to improve the Premier League. It's been fantastic. It's been a joy for me because of my affiliation, my association with Nigeria. You are listening to Elegbete TV Radio.